Ah, eu tomava na rua, mas tava de rosa. Leva pra ela. Você... I don't know how I did this time, but I did. I don't know what I did, but I, I guess I said something. What did I say? You know, you're not gonna repeat it now? Okay. <laughs> I don't know what I did! I don't know. No, I don't know. No. Who knows? Who knows? I'll get it. It'll probably come to me at the end of service. You know, but, oh, that's why. That's what. <laughs> probably not. <laughs> My wife is just shaking her head at me. Uh oh, -uh, you ain't going to get it. <laughs> you never do get it. Yeah, I know. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 tonight. We'll begin our study tonight. We'll look at two verses and then we'll, we'll jump into God's Word. So I just want to be a blessing to you tonight. And, uh, we're about to go into the summer months there, the, the craziness of school schedules and things of that nature are going on, and, and uh, don't let it distract you uh, from being faithful to the house of the Lord. Hey. We encourage you to be in your place, and uh, during the summer, it's easy to slack off. Um, trust me, there's many times I want to slack off, but don't let yourself do that. Don't let yourself do that. It's great to have each and every one of you tonight. First Corinthians chapter 1, let me, let's read two verses here. It says, verse 10 says, Now I beseech you, brethren, as Paul writes to the church of Corinth, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Now skip down to verse 17. For Christ has sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. I read that and I read through the rest of this passage. And but those to that, that last phrase got a hold of me. And the fact of what may, what is there things in my life that I may be doing that are causing the cross of Christ, the gospel to be of none effect, to have no effect. Are there things that I'm allowing in my life? Are there things that uh, I'm allowing to go on in my mind and in my devotional life and in my spiritual life that are causing, that's causing the gospel, Christ, to have no effect? Heaven forbid that either any of us would stand in the way of the gospel of Christ. That because of us, it would have no effect on those around us. Father, help us tonight. I pray that you open our, our hearts, our minds, and our eyes. Father, that we may hear from you tonight. Challenges, convict us, changes before we leave tonight. Father, I pray that you be with the, the uh, children down in the <clears throat> Bats Club tonight. I pray that you just bless them and speak to their hearts and lives as well. And as they prepare songs and things of that nature to sing in church. I want to give them wisdom. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Here in 1 Corinthians, how, how does a military leader win? What's one of their main ways of defeating another army? What, divide and conquer? They know if they can divide, they can uh, divide the troops, the supplies, the reinforcements. If they can keep them divided, they can win. You know, we don't fight against the dumb enemy tonight. Too many times we... we Play with Satan as if he's just a nothing, a nobody. We play with temptation like it's nothing. We allow these things in our lives. Satan is not dumb. We know that he does not have the wisdom of God, but that doesn't make him stupid either. And I want you to understand, he studies his enemies. A wise military leader will study his, his enemies. Those who he's after, he will study them to know more about them, their weaknesses. And I tell you, Satan and his henchmen, they study our weaknesses. They look for ways that they can come after us, that we are vulnerable to them. They're constantly after us. And you know, we're seeing the Christianity falling all around us. Back this morning, I saw on the broadcast of the news before I left it, to take the girls to school this morning, that Christianity 
confessing Christianity is on the decline drastically in America today. I started looking up some stats in 1948. 91% of the Americans identified with a Christian faith. 20 years ago in 1989, this was obviously taken uh, some time ago in uh, 2009, 82% of the Americans identified as Christians. 10 years ago, which would have been, uh, yeah, 10 years ago, it was 84%. That would have been, excuse me, that had been 99. In 2009, it was noted at 78%. And this morning, I heard that it was 70%. And it's falling drastically quick. It's, it's going downhill quickly. What, what is changing? What's happening to cause people to fall from believing in Christ? Can I tell you this? Satan is dividing people. He's dividing and conquering. He is trying to divide things in our lives. And as he's dividing things, he's succeeding. Well, think about it. He's dividing the word of God. How many versions of the Bible are there today? You ever thought about that? Anybody know how many there are in America today? I looked up these stats today, too. I mean, there's 50 different versions of the Bible in America today. Now, that means each one of those Bibles has to have enough change in it be denoted as a new version. A different version. The dividing words of God. He's making, he's raising questions. He's raising doubts. Because, well, my Bible doesn't say that. All across the, the Christian faith, Satan is dividing God's words. But I want, you to tell, I want you to understand this. There's 50 versions in the United States, but there's 100 versions worldwide. You see what that begins doing? It begins taking those that, that believe the truth of the Word of God and tempting them with, easier, with, with what they call easier things. Easier reading. Easier understanding. But as I was doing the study, most of those easier understandings, they tend to uh, preserve thought to thought, not word to word. There's a difference Amen. there. I want you to understand that, Brother Juan, brother you may read a, a passage of Scripture, and God may have a, give you a thought on it. I may read that same passage, and guess what? He gives me another thought. And then Brother Keith Isley reads the same passage. And he gets another thought. Well, that's three different translations according to their, the way they're translating the word of God. You see how that begins dividing truth? Satan is after us and he's attacking us. So we must hold to the true scripture, to the word of God. We've got to hold to it. And we've got to read it. We've got to understand it. We've got to study it. But he's dividing us. He's trying to divide that. This is dividing Christians. You know, he's using music to divide people today. I'm not talking about groups of people, mind you, right now. I'm talking about individuals. Because there's so many people that are not strong in their faith. And they walk into a Christian bookstore... And they see all these versions of the Bible. And that causes them to begin doubting. Because they'll say, well, why am I using this Bible? This, this Bible is so much easier to read, but they don't understand that they leave out verses. They leave out key scripture. They go based on a thought for thought translation instead of a word for word. And it begins to taking them slowly but surely away from Christ. I said, music is dividing 
individuals today. I was doing a study. I had a young man approach me this week, and he's been texting me for about two days on how to choose godly music in his life. He said, I had a friend who, who, who you know, he, he, he's a Christian friend, and he, he said, man, I got all this great music. I'm going to download it to your phone for you. And he, he gave him this whole list of music, and he said, Brother Keith, how do I know if it's good for me or not? Well, that conversation lasted two days. Brother Mike, I was still, I told y'all about it yesterday. I was still talking to him today about it. And we went through, we went through every song that was downloaded. And we talked about who the author was. I gave him some insight on the authors. And then we went through each song. We started talking about things there. Then I gave him, uh, I've, I've done many messages on music for the teens. Taught myself a lot doing that. Did the same thing for them. But as I went through it, uh, what I did was I sent him all of the information that I studied from. I said, but you've got to determine what God's word says on this matter. Sent him as much scripture as I had. There are so many verses on music in the Bible. It's just not even funny. I started to listen to them all. And I said, I could go on and on and on and on. He goes, no, you're good. You're good. I had sent him like two or three pages in an email. Fine print of verses on music and scripture. But can I tell you, Satan's using music to divide people's hearts away from God. I was amazed as I was doing, as I was looking up some of the uh, websites and things that I, I gained information from, how many of the contemporary Christian authors, when they were asked and polled by magazines, stated, well, what kind of music do you like to listen to? And they were listing all of the rock and roll stars and talking about the CDs they had in their cars that they listened to on a daily basis. But these are the Christian singers. But can I tell you, Satan is using music to divide individuals, to conquer them, to pull them away from God himself. He's using fellowship in dividing people. Different camps, groups of people. Oh, I, 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 I've listened to so-and-so preacher. I listen to so-and-so, this preacher, or this that preacher, and, and you know what, I, I've heard so many things about uh, different preachers and pe people dropping names and things of that nature, and, and whose camp are you for, and it's just you using it to divide, and guess what, it's dividing pastors, and individual pastors from Christ. And instead of following Christ as much, they're following individuals. Can I tell you tonight, we must be careful. We must be guarded. Here, this is what Paul hears about the church of Corinth. He says uh, that he's concerned that everyone would speak the same thing, that there be no what divisions among you. But see, in verse 11 it says, For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Now this I say that every one of you said, I am of Paul, and I am of Apollos, and I am of Cephas, and I am Christ. See, the people in the, in the, in the, this city of Corinth, they began saying, well, I am of so-and-so, and well, I am of so-and-so, and I'm following so-and-so. And, and all of a sudden it became a big division amongst the church of Corinth. If Satan can keep us divided, he will win. Right. If he can keep our minds split on things, he's going to win. If he can keep you doubting or questioning things in God's word, he's going to win. If he can divide our thinking, he is one. How do I know that? James 1.8. A double-minded man is what? Unstable in all his ways. I want you to understand, and please don't take me wrong, I want you to please understand, Satan 
wants to destroy you. Look, you're here on a Wednesday night. Guess what? He wants to take you down. And he's going to raise doubts. He's going to raise questions. He's going to raise accusations. He's going to use music. He's going to use uh, false scripture. You know, it's just as easy. Uh, and so many times we'll go on to, you know, some of you use Facebook. Some of you uh, go online or somebody sends you an email and it's got scripture in it. And it's another perversion of the word of God. And within it, man, it sounds great. You go look it up, and that's not exactly what it says. We've got to be careful. I want you to notice verse 10. Paul states that there is division going on. They were divided by names, verse 12. Now this I say that every one of you said, I am of Paul, and I am of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. Here's a four-way division in that church. Of them saying, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas, and I am of Christ. What does the Bible say? God is not the author of what? Confusion. Confusion. Obviously, there's some confusion going on here. There's some doubting, some questioning going on. Some fellowship issues going on here. They were divided by words. Notice in verse 17 that I read, for Christ sent me not to baptize. Paul says, look, you're not of me. He says, I didn't even baptize. If you go and you read uh, verse 14, 15, 16, he says uh, he baptized the household of Stephanus, but that's it. But in verse 17 says, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Not with wisdom of words. Not with wisdom of words. I had a friend in college that was great with words. In fact, most of the time, he was all about being on the wrong side of an argument for the fun of it. If you didn't believe, uh, you know, we don't believe in abortion, he would fight for abortion in, in your argument just for the fun of it. He found that fun. Oh, he used to. Oh. The whole time I know he doesn't believe the way he's arguing, but he still argues that way and frustrates me. Frustrated. But the wisdom of words. Here he says, look, I didn't come to preach using the wisdom of words. I, I'm not here to, to preach uh, words, wisdom, words that profound you and that draw you to think that I'm smarter or I'm wiser. It's, that's not what it's all about. So there was a division going on of, of literally the wisdom of words and how they used, how they spoke, how they, they preached. Once again, that goes back to that fellowship. I am of Stephanus. I am of Cephas. I am of Apollos. I am of... And that's what they were doing. But number three, I want you to see they were divided by wisdom itself. Look at verse 21. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Uh, here in the city of Corinth here, they had this thing going on where you had the Jews and you had the Gentiles and uh, the Jews look for a sign, it says in verse 22, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. And so there was this constant struggle amongst the Jews and the Greeks and, and how do you reach them? But one of the div dividing conflicts was the Greeks said, I don't, we don't need a sign, we want wisdom. We want somebody who's learned in the scripture. We want somebody who's been taught, who's been schooled, who's been educated. That's what we want. And Paul was saying, look, God saying through Paul, look, the world's wisdom is foolishness with God. And God's wisdom is foolishness with man. So there's these things going on in the church of Corinth, and they're dividing the people in the church of Corinth. Dividing individuals, dividing people from the church, from the truth. From the word of God. Just as Satan is trying to divide us. Each one of us we go through different. We have different things going on in our lives. 
Every one of us has, whether it's work, whether it's family, whether it's our neighbors, whether it's our neighborhood, whether it's a car situation, whether it's a house situation, whatever it is, something's going on in our lives that's different than, than the other person. And Satan is looking for your weaknesses to try to divide and conquer you. All right. Tonight there are many all over the city that are out of church tonight that ought to be in church. I'm talking about the entire city of Atlanta. I'm just talking here. There are many people because they've been divided. They have their, personally they've been divided. And Satan is winning the battle. Can I show you tonight four ways if we'll stay this way. If we'll focus on these four areas in our life, can I tell you, it'll be hard for us for Satan to divide us. It'll be real hard for Satan to come in between us and our Savior. It'll be real hard for Satan to come between us and the Word of God. I'm going to give them to you quickly tonight. Number one, I, love, I like this one. Stay ignorant the teachable. My God. Remember I told you, one of the things that was dividing them was wisdom. How many times uh, don't think we know everything and be willing to learn and listen? Too many times, and this is what came to my mind as I was, as I was reading this uh, and, and praying over this. Too many times we come to the word of God saying, I've heard, read, remembered this story from before. I mean, how many times have you you've read a, a story in the scripture, or I've even got it to preach a story in scripture? And you go, oh man, I, I've heard that one before. Oh, I, I'm, I'm good. And you kind of tune things out. You don't do that when you read, do you? You get to the point where you're reading over scripture, and uh, one of the favorite ones, David and Goliath. You've read it, you've heard it preached, you've heard it taught a billion times. And you go to the scripture and you begin reading in 1 Samuel chapter 17. And you begin reading through it. And la da 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 And before you know it, you're to the end of it. And you've not even thought about what you read. Because because you knew what chapter you were on. And you knew what reference you were reading. All of a sudden, you tune things out. And listen to what I just said. May I stay ignorant but teachable. May I read... Scripture, may I listen to God's word. May I focus on not what I know, but what God is trying to teach me. Can I tell you, it's no accident when you get up in the morning to read your, your Bible. It's no accident the scripture that God has you reading for that day. It's not an accident. And there is something in there that he wants to teach you. But if you are like me, and you get to that familiar passage. I've read the, the book of First, First Corinthians. I can't even tell you how many times. And I've read these passages so many times. But it's about recognizing that I need to stay ignorant but teachable. And I don't mean stay dumb. I'm not, that's not what I'm saying. But keep my mindset of always looking for what God wants to teach me. Always seeking, because I want you to say Proverbs 9, verse 9 says, Give instruction to a wise man, and he will be yet wiser. Teach a just man, and he will increase in learning. I want to be that man that when God wants to teach me something, he teaches it to me, and I'm like that sponge, and I'm soaking it up. Ignorant. Teachable by God. Psalm chapter 25 verse 4 says, show me thy ways, O Lord. David speaking here, he says, show me thy ways, O Lord. Teach me thy paths. Lead me in thy truth and teach me, for thou art the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all the day. May this week I stay ignorant, but teachable. Not trusting in my own knowledge. Not trusting in man's wisdom as the church of Corinth was. May I say ignorant, but teachable by God. Number two, may I stay foolish, but usable by God. 
foolish but usable God by God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. Here he begins talking about the foolish things of God. He, he wants to use, excuse me, uh, verse 27. But God had chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. And God had chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty. I want to stay foolish but usable. And I don't want to stay that foolish that's always joking, never takes anything serious. But I want to just, once again, not relying in my own strength, not relying in what I have to offer, not relying in who I am, but remaining usable by God. Yes. Because see, when I get trusting in my own strength, when I get trusting in my own self, guess what? I become unusable by God. Because he wants to use the foolish things to confound the wise. He doesn't need somebody that knows he's all that. He doesn't need somebody that thinks they've got it all under control. He needs someone that's, that's trusting in his strength and his alone to get him through. Psalms chapter 8 verse 2. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast ordained strength because of thy enemies. Thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. You know, today, many people overlook children and, and the truth that they have to share with us. I know this to be true. I have four children in my home. I often overlook the truth that they, you know, they want to share with me. Many people in the world look at them as foolish. And I want to be just like that child in God's eyes, but usable. Maybe teachable. I must be usable. Number three tonight, I want to keep myself weak, but resting in God's strength. Weak, but rest. What did I say just a minute ago in verse 27? God hath chosen the weak things of this world to confound the things which are mighty. Not resting in our own strength. Adrian Rogers told a story about a woodpecker pecking on a tree. In the middle of his pecking, a bolt of lightning hit that tree. Split it right down the middle. The woodpecker just kind of flew there for a moment. Investigating the whole thing. They flew away. Later that day, he returned with nine other woodpeckers. Proudly, he said, there it is, gentlemen. Right there. That's what I did. When we do that as men and women, God shuts off the lightning. Right. When you try to take credit for what God is doing, God shuts off the lightning. And you are left with what you can do alone. i got to tell you, it's not very much. But I desire to stay weak and rest in his See, I was, I've been subbing a shop class this week. Uh, the main shop teacher, they were on a missions trip. And they were out of the state. And, and so they had us building these benches and, and uh, out on the playground. And, and I was helping teach these 6th, 7th, and 8th graders how to use power tools. There's two of us. Another man was helping me with his class. You know, it's a dangerous thing to have a seventh grader holding a power tool, mm -hmm. a power drill. Mm -hmm. We're putting these benches together and, and we're showing them how to get a, a screw started in, into a piece of wood. And, and uh, you know, it's amazing they don't recognize the power that they're holding. I had one boy, we were finishing up the project today, and we we're putting the, the slats across the top of the bench. And, and the boy, he takes my power drill and he's, he's holding the screw and he gets it going and he, and he goes, and he gets it started and then he looks up and he goes, look! He goes right to the board. The screw comes all the way through the board and the board pops up and I said, well, I guess we weren't supposed to do that, were we? He looked at me and he goes, uh, oops. That's their favorite saying when they're doing something with me, uh, oops. I said, all right, you get a regular screwdriver. 
Ever tried to put a screw through wood with a regular screwdriver? It's not easy. So here they were for the rest of the class, cranking down with a regular screwdriver. But can I tell you, I'd rather be that regular screwdriver with the hand of God on my life than a power screwdriver that is eventually going to run out of batteries. Right. Amen. See, that's where we are many times. We're that power drill, and we're trusting in the battery we have attached to ourselves. And guess what? That battery runs out. And it's not like it recharges in two minutes. The worst thing that happens is uh, we were in the middle of working on remodeling, and, and uh, I've got all, you know, we're using all sorts of power. We've got a power saw and a power this and a power this, and they all use the same batteries. So I'm just taking that battery and I'm just swapping the tools I need until they all die. And then you're shot because you have nothing to work with. Well, too many times we get that way in our lives with God. We cut trust in our own strength and not His. Weak, resting in His strength. Lastly, tonight, we use a word. That, got, that I saw in this passage. Remaining base. But close. Look at verse 28. Let's start back in verse 27. But God had chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. God had chosen the weak things of this world to confound the things that are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen. Yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are. May we stay base. What do you mean by that? Let me, let me read you another passage and help you understand that. Base is like the lowest of low. Luke chapter 18, a familiar passage to some. Luke chapter 18, the Bible says in verse 13, And the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as, as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For every one that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. May we stay base, but close. Humble, but close. I want to be at his hands, easy to be used. Psalm 34, 18, the Lord is nigh to them that are of a broken heart. And say that such as be of a contrite spirit. It's when I get proud that God steps away. It's when I begin trusting in myself that God, and look, he, doesn't, he never leaves me nor forsakes me. But my fellowship with him is not as close as it was when I'm proud or when I'm trusting in myself. First Peter chapter 5 verse 6, that humble yourselves therefore in the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Why tonight should we make sure that we are staying ignorant but teachable? Why foolish but usable? Why weak but resting? Why base but close? Well, I want you to see why. Paul was talking about these things. Notice verse 29. Why? That no flesh should glory in his presence. That's why God uses these things. I want to be one of those that God uses. So that he gets the honor. He gets the glory. I want you to see this and then we'll close. Look at Chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians. Paul's writing here. Again, he says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom. Now notice he's basing this off of the conversation he's just having. He said, look, when I came to you, I didn't use excellent, high, flute words. And I didn't use man's wisdom. I didn't use all the learning that I had. Remember, he was a well-studied person. 
But he didn't come to them with that. But continue on. Declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom. But in demonstration of the spirit and of power. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men. But in the power of It all comes down to this. Our lives should be about demonstrating the power of God in our lives. It should be about demonstrating God's power in our lives, God's ability in our lives, God's doing in our lives, God's strength in our lives, not our own. Not what we have to offer. Not what we have done. But what he does in and through us. Tonight, whose power have you demonstrated this week? Tonight, whose strength have you demonstrated this week? Can I tell you what many times my problem is? I have demonstrated the wrong power. I have demonstrated the wrong strength. I have demonstrated the wrong uh, wisdom. Why? Because I am so, because I have not kept myself ignorant but teachable. I have not kept myself foolish but usable. I have not kept myself weak but resting. I have definitely not kept myself base. something, these are four areas that I have to work on and I, I believe that I'm not the only one in this room that say, you know what, I need to work on this this week. Because I want to, this week, the rest of the remainder of this week, I want to be able to demonstrate the power of God. To see, it's only Him that can change lives, not me. And when we all come to that realization that I have nothing I say can change your life, Nothing I say can do anything, but God's power in your life can change your life. But when I, can, when I start realizing that and applying it on a daily basis, I wonder what God could do around me. I wonder what God could do around you. The remainder of this week. Every head bowed, every eye closed tonight. Whose wisdom have you been relying on this week? Whose knowledge? Whose ability? Whose strength? Have you relied on this week? Have you demonstrated the power of God? power of key. We demonstrate the power of God and the power of John. Have you demonstrated the power of God or your own power? Paul's prayer is that he would demonstrate the power of God in his life. Tonight I've given you four areas that we must focus on remaining that way that God's power would be shown. As the music begins to play tonight, maybe, maybe tonight, God has spoken to your heart, your life. We always open up the altar. Maybe tonight you need to come and just seek God's forgiveness for trusting in your own strength this week. Not demonstrating His power, but demonstrating your own. Not resting in Him, but worrying and fretting about what you can do to fix things. Tonight, we'll take a moment, we'll stand to our feet. Let's stand to our feet, heads bowed, eyes closed. Brother Long's going to sing the saints of invitation. Maybe tonight, you need to come and 
just spend some time kneeling at the altar saying, God, please, the rest of this week, help 